Carter for it. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for um, this month's webinar. Uh, we are, uh, I'm Kira Duke with the Teaching with Primary Sources program at Middle Tennessee State University. Um, and we are excited to be offering this webinar on songs and the labor movement. Um, before I turn things over to our partner for this um, at the East Tennessee Historical Society, just a couple of quick things. Uh, one, we are recording this. Um, so if you would, just be sure to keep yourselves muted um, to help us have a clear audio. Um, and if you haven't already done so, so please open up the chat box um, and feel free to use that to again, introduce yourselves um, and ask questions, uh, you know, and again, just kind of discuss what we're going as we go through. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat box um, and use that again to kind of get, get questions and, and interaction that way. Um, also, for those of you joining us live this afternoon, um, if you will take a moment to complete the contact form that we've added um, into the chat box there, um, and please be sure to add uh, in your address there at the bottom of that, because those of you participating with us live today um, are eligible for a stipend, and we'll talk about kind of the process for that um, on the end. But do be sure to put your home mailing address on that contact form. So uh, as we go forward, uh, I want to take just a moment to uh, turn things over to our partners at the East Tennessee Historical Society um, who are working with us for um, this event. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Layla. Hey, y'all. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Layla Smallwood. I'm the Education Program Manager for the East Tennessee Historical Society. And we're so excited to be hosting this event and partnering with Teaching with Primary Sources, MTSU. Um, I just wanted to put a few things on your radar that we'll be partnering with MT or TPS MTSU for over the next few months. In February, on February 17th, we'll have a webinar similar to this format, same time, 4 p.m., 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, it'll focus on Francis Perkins and the role of the Secretary of Labor. Um, the session will explore how Francis Perkins um, helped shape New Deal policy. So if that's something you're interested in, please register for that. And we'll also be having an in-person workshop here at the East Tennessee History Center in downtown Knoxville in March. So if you want to do some in-person work with us, please register for that. We'd love to have you. We'll be doing something called Back to the Basics, where we look at so, um, great basic strategies to use with your primary sources. And that'll be March 31st, and it'll be an all-day session in downtown Knoxville at the East Tennessee History Center. So if you're interested in any of those sessions, please register, reach out to Kira Duke or to Lisa Oakley. I'll drop Lisa's email and my email in the chat box. And if you have any questions about East Tennessee history or any educational needs, I'll drop my email in the chat box as well. We're super excited for this webinar and really excited to be partnering with TPS and TSU today. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Layla. Uh, I'm Stacy Graham. I'm also with uh, Teaching the Primary Sources MTSU. And uh, today I'm going to start off by introducing our guest speaker. And his name is Dr. Brian Dempsey. We're very happy to have him here. This is his first time working with TPS. Um, uh, Dr. Dempsey is Assistant Professor of History at the University of North Alabama. And he's also the director of the Public History Center there. Uh, he actually got his PhD in public history at MTSU. Uh, and he works on uh, the relationship between landscapes and cultural identity, the connections between the arts and historical interpretation, and the impact of heritage tourism in communities. And he's also worked in the music industry and his dissertation was on a music heritage tourism topic. Uh, so he's well versed in all the themes we're going to be talking about. And so without further ado, I am going to turn things over to Dr. Dempsey. Well, thank you, Dr. Graham. Um, and I am going to go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. Um, and hopefully this works well. There we go. Is that coming up for everyone? All right. Well, I am. I'm honored to be here uh, to talk with you about Woody Guthrie today. Um, I know I have around 20 minutes, so I'm going to try to keep things fairly brief and hit upon some themes that I think might be relevant to Woody Guthrie, um, sort of depression in Cold War America, uh, and uh, music related to to American labor history. Uh, so, you know, I think Woody Guthrie um, is a really good window. Uh, I'll be talking at the end of the chat about using Guthrie as both source, but also window for students to think about three distinct 
uh, moments in American history. Uh, Guthrie, I have a, just a brief biography here. Uh, I won't be able to get into all of the details about his full life and experience, but he's born in 1912 in Okemah, Oklahoma. And, you know, for those of you who are well versed in, in this moment, he's born right in the middle of the progressive era. And he's actually named for Woodrow Wilson. His full name is Woodrow Wilson Guthrie. And he's born into a family of Democrats. His father uh, is a Democrat. Um, and, you know, he's also born into sort of a spatial context out there in the, in the Midwest and in, in the West and the Great Plains of extreme sort of change, social migration, uh, boom and bust cycles. Uh, he will in some ways serve as a mouthpiece for, you know, moments in American history um, of great change. And so, you know, I think Guthrie, you know, the, the, the photograph here, I'll kind of refer to this, this notion of this machine kills fascists. It's a, it's a famous image that, that Guthrie is associated with. And I'll try to kind of tease out some of the more radical sort of uh, uh, perspectives about Guthrie. I think he serves as a, as a sort of a, a window into some of the more radical versions uh, of American history, at least interpretations of American history, certainly from this moment. But he's born into this sort of creative musical family. Um, he has early on in life, he experiences quite a bit of loss. Uh, and his mother, for example, eventually contracts Huntington's disease. Uh, she will die of that. Uh, doctors during this period did not truly understand, at least early on in, in her life, what this disease was about. Uh, he will lose a sister early on in a fire. His father uh, experiences a house fire. Uh, and so sort of a tragic early experience. But Guthrie is a precocious young kid. Uh, he reads voraciously. He does attend some schooling in, in and amongst his rambling. He's very famous for being connected as being sort of this prototypical rambler of the age. Um, but when he does attend school, the subjects that he's really interested in would be geography and typing. Uh, he gets A's in those two subjects. And I think that's interesting. I mean, Woody Guthrie develops into not only a, a, an artist associated with music, but a very well-rounded creative producer of, of both literature, short, short stories, of course, songs, uh, and, and the like. Um, early on, he develops kind of a, this idea to create a character for himself. He's kind of a slight child. Um, he's often picked on when he goes to school. So he quickly learns early in life that if he can perform for his cohorts, if he can entertain them, that will kind of sort of mitigate uh, some of the bullying that he actually experienced in life. Um, but also during, as he's experiencing, you know, by the time he's 10 years old, 15, 18 years old, um, in this sort of intermittent period of, of moving in and out of, of his local region, Guthrie becomes aware of kind of these boom and bust cycles uh, that will begin to envelop certain parts of the plains and the West. Certainly, as we get into the 1920s, uh, Guthrie is very well aware of the impact of uh, economic depression. Uh, and so, you know, Okama, Oklahoma, eventually Pampa, Texas is where Guthrie will sort of uh, roam and migrate with his family. He will witness some of these oil boom and bust cycles, and he'll also begin to have this consciousness about how those cycles impact everyday Americans. I mean, he's living among folks uh, who are farmers, uh, who are tied to the land, who increasingly cannot make ends meet because of the, uh, the onset of the depression, certainly after 1929, but also within the environmental catastrophe that becomes the Dust Bowl. And I think these early experiences for Guthrie as a young, young person, witnessing some of the, uh, the dislocations of people because of the economy, because of the environmental impact of things like the Dust Bowl, really shapes his early personality and his early persona. Uh, so he develops this ability in some ways to perceive events and then describe those events early on through uh, actual visual artistry. He's, he, he makes drawings, he actually survives and makes a, an early living as a young man, as a sign painter. And so he uses in some ways the visual arts um, as a way to 
as a made way to make an early living, but also to begin to sort of visually represent uh, the events going on around him. And I have a, just a few things on this early slide, agrarianism, populism, socialism, and progressivism, the various isms of this particular period. I think Guthrie is born into this political moment in which these words and these isms are resonating in the national culture and in, in the global culture. Uh, and so we have to kind of place Guthrie within that moment of time in which these ideas, ideas like socialism, uh, that Guthrie will either be accused of adhering to in his life or championed as a cause of um, social causes. And I think early on with Guthrie, rather than being um, say a fundamentalist Christian, he is born into a Christianity that can be referred to as kind of a Christian socialism out on the Great Plains. Um, this is not a materialistic or atheistic socialism. This is one that was much more about looking at uh, the example of Christ as a champion of the working person, uh, and thus in some ways disavowing materialism, uh, moving away or moving into what would become critiques of capitalism. And I think by setting Woody Guthrie up in this way, kind of placing him within his context, we can better understand some of his later writings and better understand that sort of image on that guitar that says this machine kills fascists and kind of think about some of the ways that he tried to employ uh, that, that imagery. By the, early, by the late 1920s, certainly by the 1930s, uh, Guthrie will eventually move from Pampa, Texas. He will experience the dust storm uh, along with his fellow migrants. He will describe this dust storm both in song, but also in his, in his written uh, sort of prose output. And he will describe a moment in which the dust is coming into Pampa, Texas. Uh, the folks his, his, in his neighborhood are watching the dust storm roll in. They go into a room of, of, of one of their houses. Uh, they can't see their hands. Uh, it's so dark from the dust. And suddenly he describes the people around him beginning to talk like it's the end of the world, that there's this sort of millennial view in which the dust represents in some ways uh, uh, the great trial for humanity. And he, he was not kidding about this. He actually talked about this in his interviews with Alan Lomax in 1940. And so there's this sort of, there's this mixture of Guthrie being able to place himself both inside events, but also kind of outside of those events as, a, as, a, as an objective sort of observer. And he begins to develop a sensibility that these are moments that are important. And if I can craft a, a, a piece of creative work to describe those things, I might be able to, uh, to help things, to help people, to help people understand what was happening to them. After this event, um, so this is, this is late 1930s, after this event, this great dust storm in Pampa, Texas, he decides to pull up roots and begin his sort of primary period, I guess I call it, of, of rambling. This is the moment in which he will join those caravans, those hundreds of thousands of migrants leaving places like Texas and Oklahoma and other parts of the, of the Great Plains and, and, and parts of the even upper south, moving to what they would think would be the promised land. And they're gonna to move towards California and the West. Uh, they begin to hear about um, through handbills and sort of word of mouth and even early radio, great advertisements coming out of California, seeking workers. Um, the Dust Bowl had not ravaged obviously that region. It's a different environmental context, but they begin to view after they lose their farms, after they don't have the ability to pay their debts as a result of this environmental catastrophe, they see California as the promised land. Uh, Guthrie joins these migrant caravans. He will move across the country uh, by both train, automobile, sometimes on foot. He will join migrant camps. And again, he will operate as almost a chronicler of their experience as he's, as he's part of, sort of part of the experience. So he moves to California. And by this time he's picking up the folklore of these migrant camps and these worker camps. As he sits around the fires with some of these folks, he's sort of enthralled by some of the songs he's hearing. I mean, he's in some ways very well attuned to the folklore, and he calls it folklore of, of these communities. He runs into former Wobblies, uh, IWW members, who can recall an earlier generation that talked about the need 
uh, to unionize, to collectivize, to try to in some ways come together to combat the economic pressures that people were feeling as working people. And he's very impressed uh, by some of these songs that he's hearing. And he hears about this guy, uh, various early sort of early artists, Joe Hill and others of an earlier generation who would talk about coming together, talking about organizing. And Joe Hill was a union organizer in the generation prior to Rudy Guthrie. Uh, that was killed because of his associations with some of this union activity. Um, and it, before Joe Hill died, he basically says, don't, don't mourn me, organize. And this had a profound impact, I think, on not only former Wobbly members, uh, members of the emerging left during this period, but also Guthrie himself. And he begins to emulate some of the styles he's hearing about um, some of the songs and, and some of the stories that he's hearing in these migrant camps. Um, he eventually gets to California uh, in the late 1930s. He, uh, he finds a cousin of his who is connected to a radio station. Um, and he begins to, after some sort of early odd jobs selling liquor and that kind of thing, um, he starts performing on a radio station uh, in, in Los Angeles um, by way of a family member. And I think one of the, in some ways, this kind of pushes a little bit at the myth of Woody Guthrie as um, someone who is from kind of both from the earth, but maybe a poor background. Guthrie was, a, was, was coming from a very solid sort of middle-class background. And he did have assistance along the way as he's kind of rambling across the country. But he finds himself at a radio station. And by this time, he's, he's sort of developing a persona. He's developing a way in which he presents his songs and his, and his written work. And it's a persona that was picked up and sort of fashioned from his interaction with these migrant workers and these labor camp workers uh, and others, these transient individuals in search of uh, a way to make a living. And so much like Bob Dylan will do, right, in his transition from Robert Zinnerman to, 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 to Bob Dylan, he kind of fashions a character for himself. And it's really effective in not only his performance as a musician, but in his uh, sort of interaction with folks. He understands that if he can develop sort of a common language, the way he speaks, he, he kind of, you know, he, he uses a, a very sort of um, challenge grammatically, so to speak, dialect. And what he's trying to do is identify with common people who are struggling. And he develops a very sort of early way of writing songs that are both simple, but complicated at the same time. He's trying to, in some ways, craft stories that are very easily understood that could be picked up and then sort of repeated over time that are also conveying quite complicated, complex ideas. And I think in this way, Woody Guthrie was an intellectual. I mean, he was, he was um, you know, he was, he was very much a, a very astute observer of what was happening, certainly in California. And he described, for example, when migrants would come to the, the California border and be met by police uh, or local law enforcement individuals and would either be barred entrance or they would be forced to show that they had $25 in their pockets. And if they had the money, they could come into California. And he writes a song about it called Do Re Mi, in which he describes, look, you know, California is shiny and, and we've been sold a great dream. But when you get here, it might not be so hot. So in this way, again, in his early life, Guthrie is really sort of picking up on this idea to communicate complicated stories uh, through the experience of the common man. So on this radio station, he begins to both perform, but he also kind of writes uh, other forms um, sort of describing these experiences. And then he becomes associated with something called the People's Daily World, which was a Western uh, left-leaning uh, communist associate, associated with communism sort of uh, paper. And he writes a column called What He Says. And, you know, one of the, re one of the ways he's able to do this, he's already sort of developed a reputation uh, as sort of a spokesperson for what Californians were referred to as Okies. And these would be people that were coming from Oklahoma and Texas and Tennessee and part of the Great Plains. Okie was a catch-all term to describe these migrants in search of work who have lost their farms, who have lost their jobs, who had who were looking for 
for uh, basic living. Um, and he is talking about their experiences and he writes these columns in something called What He Says. And what's interesting about this is that he, as he's adopting sort of very um, primitive uh, language and dialect, he's really attacking capitalism in these columns. And, you know, a lot of this early association of Guthrie with uh, sort of new left thinking, with, with, uh, with even the People's Daily World and others, you know, over time in our historical and sort of memory of Guthrie, that memory has often been left out. I mean, it's something that we don't, we're talking about more and more, um, but when we get to this, this is the most famous song, This Land is Your Land, and we'll talk about sort of these hidden verses. Um, I think in some ways, when you look back at what he's writing in the moment, in the late 1930s, um, quite radical stuff, you know, quite radical direct critiques of capitalism uh, in the United States as he is associating himself with, with various people in California. So again, at the end of this slide, trying to kind of create a, a general portrait of, of, of Guthrie and his movement, he's going to employ artistry and activism uh, as he's surveying this experience of the common people really sort of fleeing the Dust Bowl and having to deal with um, economic inequality in the United States. And he will identify himself with common laborers. He will write columns that if not, if, if they didn't all speak to the notion of organization and unionism, most of them in some ways spoke to the idea of um, an eventual need for workers uh, to, to uh, have a better shake in the American experience. So out of California, as, as I mentioned before, he, he's kind of mixing it up with, with, uh, with some of these, these new left folks. Um, he eventually will migrate sort of back across the country. And this way I see him as kind of a Whitman-esque or even Kerouacian figure kind of crisscrossing the country, uh, trying to document what he's seeing and, and converting that, that observation into song, into visual art, uh, into uh, weekly columns for uh, newspapers. Uh, and he will try to, in some ways, publish as much of his work anywhere that will, that will sort of have him. Um, I do want to sort of talk about him in, in some ways that there is this idea that, that, that Woody Guthrie potentially was a communist. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that he, you know, Woody Guthrie was more of an individualist as he advocated for organization, which kind of complicates his narrative. Um, he did attend uh, meetings with communists. He did associate himself and perform at, 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 at communist meetings and, and meetings that would have been defined by uh, socialists. Uh, certainly he would have performed at union meetings across the country. Um, but I think in some ways he represents this interesting mix of um, sort of what I described before as kind of Christian socialism coming from the Midwest and from where he came from in Texas and Oklahoma. Um, along with this idea that significant fundamental change needed to happen in the United States. That certainly speaks to some of the rhetoric coming out of the New Deal uh, in the 1930s of which he was a supporter. Um, he did support uh, the election of Roosevelt, though he could be critical of uh, some of Roosevelt's policies, of course. Um, but it's during this time, the late 1930s, 1939, getting into 1940, that uh, Guthrie will kind of migrate back east, uh, sort of depositing his first family back in Texas and then going to New York. Um, and I think in New York, this is where Guthrie becomes associated with that sort of uh, cadre of what we now talk about as sort of the, the you know, the folk revivalists uh, in New York City, in the east. Uh, these are people like Pete Seeger, um, even Lead Belly, who's a blues artist, but would have been defined as sort of a folk blues artist in that period. Uh, his close confidant, Cisco Houston, uh, women such as Sis Cunningham, for example. These were all kind of a loose collection of folk singers, artists, um, certainly leftists, uh, pro-union people who were also performers. Uh, Woody Guthrie falls in with this crowd. He writes songs for the Almanac Singers as an example. Um, he will perform and record his own music 
Uh, this will be for Folkways and he will mix it up with Alan Lomax uh, during this period. But I think when he comes back to New York, um, in some ways, he is employing the learning that he's had out in California. And, you know, I think this is when Guthrie not only adopts kind of a down home folksy persona, but in some ways he's doing that to get across, again, what I would argue is quite radical sort of thinking when you compare it to some of the tenants that are happening across the country at the time. Um, certainly leftist, certainly both the Almanac singers, but in, in, in Guthrie's own politics during this era in 1940 is where we are. Um, he's a supreme anti-fascist. Obviously World War II is looming. He's aware of what Hitler's doing in Europe, but some of Guthrie's writing during this time will, will remain very pro-Russia uh, and, and sort of, this is where we get that association with Guthrie as communist. Um, but he's also, again, fundamentally pro-union, pro-civil rights uh, during this era. Um, I think Guthrie is a good window for us to think about um, sort of biography in American history. Guthrie shows the capacity to evolve and change in his life. It's probably clear that his father, um, was, as a Democrat, you know, early in the progressive era in Oklahoma and Texas, was probably affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan. Later in life, during this period, Guthrie will disavow that. Guthrie will come out uh, uh, in a full-throated sort of support for uh, equality and civil rights. Um, but along this line, he's very much what I call sort of pro-folk in parentheses, pro-common person. And I include this, this is, a, this is an image from one of the um, Almanac Singers uh, records during the time. This is actually a, a record that, that Guthrie did not contribute to. He will contribute to subsequent records. But I think the imagery uh, in this, in this uh, album sleeve is instructive. Uh, it's very much depicting uh, sort of both an idealized, but also the experience of the common person uh, in the United States. And this is certainly something that Seeger and Guthrie and Leadbelly and others uh, were talking about both in song, but, but in their written work. What's interesting is that Guthrie will actually sort of be part of uh, the, the military apparatus during World War II. He will be, he'll be part of the Merchant Marine. He'll actually be drafted uh, and be part of an army unit. And when you look at some of the photographs of Woody Guthrie uh, in the army, he's very disheveled. Guthrie was famous for and again, this was part of his, his sort of conscious persona of um, being quite shabby in his dress. And so if you look at Guthrie compared to some of the other sharp military dressers in his unit, here he is standing there. He's, he's kind of a slight figure. His pants are far too big. His pockets are hanging out. His shirt is barely tucked in. And I would argue that Guthrie is still trying to assert um, sort of this persona of, you know, the common person in the military. Uh, in some ways, it's it's kind of a you know it's kind of a protest of his experience in the military, even as he's participating in kind of that that experience of World War II. He will serve on three different ships uh, during this war, um, and he will sort of evolve from a, a, a strong anti-war stance to quite the pro-war stance as he's participating uh, in an anti-fascist war that he comes to define. But through all of this, what's interesting, when the war ends and he sort of finishes his term of service, he will go back to New York, go back to the West on alternating trips, and he will pick back up with, um, with his staunch defense of organization, of collectivist activities in the United States. Um, he will define, he will sort of conflate communism and socialism. His, his sort of ultimate dream is for the workers to, to become the leadership of the United States. And I think, again, you know, if we're talking about this in the context of post-World War II, where the Cold War is heating up, uh, Guthrie is very well aware that the FBI is investigating some of his, some of his friends and certainly folks on the left and anybody associated with excuse me, communism in any way, yet he is continuing to write and perform um, uh, songs uh, and, and written work that really do speak to um, sort of this, this notion that, the, that, that, that America is upside down economically, that he's speaking to wealth inequalities and, and he's speaking to social inequalities. Um, 
uh, that I think that are that are a little bit more radical than we've associated with Guthrie, I think, for, for a while. It's during this time as well, and I'll kind of backtrack just a little bit to say by 1940, he will record his first full collection, first album of songs that could be considered an early concept album. This is called Dust Bowl Ballads. This in some ways um, really sort of uh, um, coheres this idea that that Guthrie is a spokesperson for the Okies. They call him the Okie Bard uh, through through these songs. Um, uh, later on, you know, he will he will he will record. I think he records only about seventy five of his own songs out of three thousand uh, that he will eventually write. What's interesting about Guthrie is that most of the songs we associate him with were actually recorded by other people through other voices. I think that speaks in some ways to the resonance of his, of certainly his artistry, but also his ideas over time. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up here in, in a few minutes, but I do wanna speak to a couple things that I know Dr. Graham and Kira have, have put together for the lesson. That is one of his most famous songs, maybe his most famous song that we all identify uh, with is, is This Land Is Your Land. He writes this um, at the end of the 1930s, uh, February 1940 is when he kind of gets this thing down and in, into its 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 finalized form. Um, many of you are probably well aware of the fact that this song has been recorded by lots of folks. It's been recorded in different ways. Um, I think recently it's been recorded and remembered in its full the way Guthrie sort of wrote it originally. But I think if we if if you sang this song in school in grade school, certainly I have a memory of this. Um, I there are certain verses in this song that were not sung. And I think that that kind of speaks again to Guthrie's ranging sort of thinking and experience, but also his distinct and very clear critique uh, of capitalism in the United States. So he's learning from this experience from 1936 to 1940, what some historians now are referring to quite the sort of the radicalization of his experience. Uh, and so I've included here just a, a brief quote, and I won't, I won't read it for you, but it's from Ronald Briley, who looks at Guthrie through this sort of more radical lens. And there's recently been another book uh, just published from uh, an English historian, and that just in, in some ways posits that Guthrie was indeed sort of an American radical. And by looking at him at that lens, it helps us understand uh, his time and place a little bit better. But I think this land is your land. You know, Guthrie writes this in response to um, God Bless America. Uh, he, he writes it in response to the, the version as sung by Kate Smith. Of course, this song was written by Irving Berlin, um, a transplant, a, an immigrant to the United States. I think we can read into God, God Bless America, Berlin's sort of um, ode to the potential of the United States for migrants of an earlier generation. Guthrie hears this in the late 1930s by 1940. And, you know, in some ways, as Guthrie was often wont to do, looks at this and sort of a, his response is kind of a, is a mixture of sarcasm, but a biting critique of what this song is conveying. This, this idea that America, uh, yes, God bless America, but in response, he writes, this land is, in, is your land. And as we'll see uh, through Dr. Stacy and, and Kira, two verses speak directly to this experience of both wealth inequality, but also private property in the United States. Uh, and he, in some ways, recasts this vision of, of America as um, not holding out the promise uh, for so many people who are struggling as it should be. I think it's also fair to say with Guthrie that you know he saw himself as an educator, so there's kind of a didactic point to much of his written work and his and his poetry and his songs. Um, he doesn't necessarily define himself as an entertainer, so he would have viewed this land as your land as both a chronicle but a description for what he viewed America should be about, which would be a land in which workers, common everyday people, had enough to live had a roof over their head, uh, and thus found a place for themselves uh, in, in the country. Um, I think if we think about some of the legacies uh, of Woody Guthrie, certainly Guthrie resonates today uh, in a profound sense. Uh, I think that if we see Guthrie as a window into those sort of distinct moments in American history through which he lived, the Depression, World War II, and Cold War, um, I think that using him as that window gives us a great insight into kind of the fuller story of the United States. And as historians and public historians, 
that is always our goal. And that is to kind of try to interpret the fuller story uh, of the country. So indeed, he was a voice for the common person, uh, everyday workers. He was also kind of a, a, a chronicler of evolving notions of freedom and equality in the United States. And, and I might argue he complicated those notions through his written work. Um, he deployed an historical consciousness in his work, which would anchor him to larger traditions in folk music, in blues music, uh, in other types of musical expression that we associate with sort of American culture. So anchored to an historical consciousness that applies the lessons of history to mod sort of modern events. Um, again, critiques of the status quo and certainly of capitalism and of nationalism and other isms of his, of his day. Um, he's also the subject of continuing ongoing scholarly debate, which as an instructor, I love. I think, uh, I think looking at Guthrie through different perspectives uh, and how we use Guthrie in different ways, I think is a very sort of uh, useful endeavor uh, in the classroom. Uh, he was a complicated figure, not a simple caricature. And I think this feeds into some of our other uh, musical and artistic heroes, certainly from the mid 20th century. People like Robert Johnson, who was a blues artist from the South, has received kind of a similar reading of, of his biography uh, lately, as if we, if we kind of compare that to Guthrie. And that is to say, these are complicated figures who are very well aware of their personas, their artistry, and maybe the impact of their work uh, on audiences and sort of that interplay between artist and audience. Um, and then lastly, you know, I think to, to kind of show some of his artistic input or influence, where most people are aware of his influence on Bob Dylan. Uh, we wouldn't have a Bob Dylan without Woody Guthrie. Uh, it, is, it is said that Bob Dylan, and, and after he discovered Woody Guthrie, would not uh, respond to you unless you called him Woody, which is interesting on, on another level with Bob. Uh, but certainly Joan Baez was very influenced by Woody Guthrie and his song structure and his ability to communicate big ideas uh, simply. Bruce Springsteen from Wilco and then Tom Morello, who's here. Tom Morello is a, from a band called Rage Against the Machine. And you see on his own guitar, he's sort of emulating Guthrie's This Machine Kills Fascists, this idea that music and art and words uh, can dismantle fascism. Uh, and Guthrie was certainly a proponent of that as, as is Tom Morello. So um, I think that's about all the time I have. I just wanted to kind of provide a, a brief overview of the person of, of Guthrie. And if we have any questions at the end of the talk, I'm happy to, to try to field those. Thank you so much, Dr. Dempsey. If anybody has any questions, um, please put them in the chat box. And um, you know, when we, when we get towards the end, uh, we can have a bit of a Q and A uh, if that's all right with uh, with Brian, and um, I, I, I just would I would love to respond to so many different things. But uh, I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to share our latest and our newest lesson plan uh, that was just posted today. That was created around the song "This Land Is Your Land," um, and I'm really glad that everybody now has a really good kind of overview of of Guthrie's life and activism. Uh, because that serves as really good context for you as a teacher. And of course, he was a very complicated figure. And so when you're teaching this era of American history, that's like fifth grade and it's high school. So fifth grade teachers will be making different decisions about how they wanna share certain aspects of Guthrie's life and his activism. And high school teachers might be making different decisions. And so, this lesson plan that I'm going to share with you is geared towards the fifth grade class, uh, but it shouldn't be hard for you high school teachers to take a look at it and figure out how you want to use it uh, if you want to use it in a high school class as well. And so Kira has just put the link uh, in there. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you all uh, what it looks like. Where are we? Okay, so she should be seeing right now the TPS main website. And so you can see that the lesson plan is under what's new, this land is your land and the power of folk songs. It's also, it also can be found of course on our lesson plans page under Great Depression and New Deal. 
uh, at the top. And because this also uh, is an ELA lesson plan, you can find it under the English Language Arts Reading Literature tab. So you can find it now in three different places on our, our website currently. And this is what it looks like. Uh, I am going to make it larger so that it's easier for you all to see. And I'm a lot of this will be very familiar to you now that we've just heard uh, Dr. Dempsey's overview and you've seen this famous photograph of him holding the guitar. And there is a point in the lesson where we ask students to analyze this photograph and you know if if they wonder <laughs> what that sticker means, this machine kills fascists, there's a definition from Merriam Webster of, of, of uh, what fascism is. And then you can maybe do a little bit of a preview of your World War II unit by talking about his role uh, during World War II in the Merchant Marine, and of course the rise of fascism in, in Europe at that time, which of course, you know, that had been going on in the 1930s as well. So um, it, uh, the investigative questions are, how does this land is your land reflect the United States of America? And then how does it reflect the experiences of everyday people during the Great Depression? Uh, we've already learned so much about how he styled himself as this mouthpiece of the common people. So how does that come out in the lyrics themselves? Uh, okay, then. So basically, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. We're not, we don't have time to do the whole thing right now. That would take like a whole hour. Um, but I am going to start off just by uh, playing a tune that's available through the Library of Congress. Um, because none of uh, Guthrie's recordings, his actual recordings are available through the Library of Congress because they're all still protected under copyright. But the Library of Congress has a lot of his writings and his correspondence. So Kira will show you that in the resources section. So I am I have to share my sound through my computer. So hopefully you'll be able to hear this version that you just start off the class with. Okay, so um, that's just a sample of a longer recording because uh, that's all that can be played on, on this website. But already you, you really get a feel for this particular version of uh, and this performance. So if you wouldn't mind uh, maybe popping in the chat box, uh, what are your impressions of this song just based on the tune? And Kira, if you wouldn't mind moderating that for me. Someone uh, thinks that it has strong Barney the Dinosaur vibes. How dare you? Uh, good for parades and open air patriotic concerts. Very patriotic. Yeah. And of course, this is the performance is by the US Coast Guard Band. So they, they have a vested interest in sounding patriotic and sounding like they're playing for parades and official kinds of uh, activities and events. And you can also see from the bibliographic page here that this is part of, you know, the Library of Congress has a collection of songs called Patriotic Melodies. And then another one called the Library of Congress celebrates the songs of America. Um, and so it's, 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 yeah, it's very patriotic. And this is an upbeat version. If you go to YouTube and you listen to Guthrie's version of it, it's, a, it, it's not quite uh, as, as Philip you know, Sousa uh, sounding. But uh, the point is to see if your students can re recognize the melody and if they know this song. Uh, and if so, do they know the words? And if you tell them this land is your land, do they recognize that? Can they sing any of it? Um, I And I have to say, I tried this out on my daughter who's in fourth grade and she recognized it immediately. I was happy to say. 
Um, so, uh, and okay, so we're gonna go back to, there we go. Now this uh, lesson plan has the worksheets attached to it. So then what you wanna do is give them this first lyric sheet. These are the um, main verses with the chorus that everybody knows. So the, this land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. And you're welcome for not singing that to you. Um, but hopefully you can in your heads or later on, or those of you who are muted, feel free to be singing this uh, yourself. <laughs> and um, so basically it's asking students to read these main verses and to comment on the song. And the, I, I already showed you a bit of a, a song analysis worksheet developed by the Library of Congress that uh, we actually link to from our analysis tools page on our website and it's linked to from the lesson plan as well that they can fill out so this might be the part that you choose to assess later in the lesson but it asks them questions you know what are your reactions to it what images do you get in your head when you're reading these lyrics listening to this melody um and then you know who do you think the audience is and those kinds of questions songs as historical artifacts and I have chosen to illustrate these verses with some really amazing photographs from a really amazing photograph collection at the Library of Congress that we use all the time, the Carol Highsmith archive. And uh, so I can't get to it because the black box is blocking me. Okay, so for example, this will just show you an overview. She has, uh, over 60, you know, almost 65,000 uh, public domain photographs that she's still adding to of just America. Buildings, towns, interiors, exteriors, uh, shots of nature, shots of just kind of cultural landscapes, roadside taverns, lots of Route 66 stuff, old cars, uh, lots of just really iconic American images. And so um, one part of the lesson plan encourages teacher, you know, encourages students to go into that and maybe illustrate the song themselves. Uh, this one right here is my absolute favorite one. Uh, this field of waving wheat, I just think is the most beautiful image that I have seen in a long time. Um, and then uh, I'm not gonna have enough time to really go through this, but then it, it also takes a look at what Woody Guthrie says about the purpose of folk songs. Now, my, my fourth grade daughter didn't really get a lot out of this. She didn't really understand what it was saying, but I'm just gonna highlight uh, one sentence to read. Uh, a folk song, and this is in Woody Guthrie's words, he's writing to Alan Lomax at the Library of Congress, a folk song is what's wrong and how to fix it, or it could be who's hungry and where their mouth is, or who's out of work and how to fix it, or who's broken where the money is, or who's carrying a gun and where the peace is. That's folklore. And folks make it up because they seen that the politicians couldn't see nothing to fix, nor nobody to feed or give a job of work. And so then uh, the lesson kind of asks them, okay, well, what? What do you think he's saying with that? What do you think his attitude is towards politicians and the value of folk songs and how they can be powerful? And it also brings up that, that photograph where he's holding the guitar that says this machine kills fascists and they can start kind of figuring out, oh, he, this is more than just a patriotic song here, right? Uh, there's a deeper message um, and there's a purpose to it. So then this is the meat of the lesson you give them the extra verses. Uh, these were um, not included in the most popular recordings, uh, like when Pete Singer sing, sang it, uh, I, I think he left these out, or it, it wasn't released in a lot of the early recordings. And in the 1950s, that makes sense because that was the McCarthy era America. Um, and the Library of Congress only restored this in like the 90s or something. But um, so there was a big high wall there that tried to stop me. The sign was painted, said private property, but on the backside, it didn't say nothing. 
This land was made for you and me. One bright sunny morning in the shadow of the steeple by the relief office, I saw my people. As they stood hungry, I stood there wondering if God blessed America for me. And so that right there, you can tell that um, he's really playing off the God bless America, Irving Ber Berlin version. Um, and uh, later on, you read that originally the last line of each verse was not this land was made for you, but in me, but God blessed America for me. And he changed it. Um, so that's a, something that will be pointed out later in the lesson. And again, they can go through and they can find images to illustrate this. This one right here of a relief office is from the Office of War Information Farm Security Administration collection, that very, very famous collection of all the Great Depression and World War II images um, at the Library of Congress, which would be a good way if you wanted to have them illustrate and match kind of images with lyrics and talk about, okay, what's the message here? And then um, if you have further time, there's, uh, excuse me, oh, I'm totally losing my tabs here. There is an article uh, that they can read that's included in a worksheet uh, that has one additional end verse there too. And it's a really good little kind of encapsulation of the history of the song and the writing of this song. Um, but uh, so this is, uh, like I said, geared towards fifth graders. There's a bunch of extra resources too for you uh, as well. Uh, there's a longer biographical article um, now, you've already gotten a really great overview from Dr. Dempsey. Uh, this one is from uh, Mark Jackson, who's actually a professor here at MTSU. He's just a couple of stories above me in this building. Um, and then there's an NPR article, and then there's a whole collection with his correspondence. I'm going to hand this over to Kira so she can show you some additional resources, because we have another lesson plan about songs in the labor movement that we want to share. Thanks, Stacey. Um, so let me pull up. So I'm gonna kind of highlight a few different things for you guys again, kind of in addition to some things that have been mentioned here that will also kind of, again, align with some of the topics that we talked about and maybe some of the names that you've heard. Um, so one, uh, of course, uh, Stacy just mentioned, we do have a lesson plan um, called Songs of the Labor Movement. Um, and this one's a few years old, it's geared towards high school, um, but you could kind of pull bits and pieces of it if you wanted to adapt it for um, younger students. Um, it is a multi-day, it looks at a couple of different songs. Um, it's a really uh, good kind of in-depth lesson plan, again, thinking about kind of how music can influence a movement. Um, and looks at, again, kind of that earlier labor movement Movement. And so you'll see that there are a couple of different songs that we look at here. Uh, one uh, looking at Pete Seeger and the song Which Side Are You On? Um, and the another one is the Paul Robeson uh, and I Dreamed I Saw Joe Hill Last Night, uh, which of course we, you know, we mentioned Joe Hill uh, briefly earlier. Um, and then this also looks at uh, kind of getting into the peak skills riots um, and then gets into looking at kind of the connection to labor and the civil rights movement, um, thinking about some of the songs that were written at Highlander Folk School um, here in Tennessee, which of course starts out with a kind of a labor focus, but then uh, moves into civil rights uh, activism um, as we get into kind of the, the 40s, 50s. Uh, and going forward. Um, this lesson plan, when you're looking at it, you will note that there are several different resources that it has with it. Um, there are information sheets, um, there is a PowerPoint that you can use, there are different worksheets. So again, there's a lot of materials here with this lesson plan um, that really kind of dig into these stories um, of these different kind of points, looking again at the influence of music and, and movements, uh, specifically the labor movement, and then going into the civil rights movement and drawing that connection. So um, this is, I mean, it's a really great lesson plan. Um, if, if it's something you're interested in, I highly recommend taking a look at this uh, and seeing again some of the great um, resources that are there. You can find this lesson plan um, on our website underneath the uh, lesson plan section, um, Reconstruction to Modern America, and it's under the Civil Rights section is where you will find it. Um, 
So that is one piece that we have. We also have, uh, we've done a couple of newsletters over the years uh, touching on music or American folk life. Um, one that we did a few years ago, uh, looking at labor, um, this was from May, 2014. Um, and we have a lesson idea in this one, looking at the songs of migrant farm workers. Uh, and so again, this is really kind of kind of ties in with what Dr. Dempsey was talking about with kind of Woody Guthrie and kind of his work um, in kind of being a time with some of the migrant workers um, in California during the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. And so again, that kind of falls in line with that time period. And so you'll see um, some of the different links here. And again, kind of thinking about what life was like for these people. So that lesson idea is available. Let's see, let me move some things here so I can get to them. Um, now, a couple of things that the Library of Congress has that you might want to take a look at if you're wanting to kind of build your own activity. Um, there is a large collection called the Library of Congress Celebrates the Songs of America. Um, this is a massive collection of music. Um, you know, some of it's recorded. Um, but there are, uh, what, I, what I really like about this one is there's a whole section called articles and essays. And actually anytime that you find a collection, if you look at the collection homepage, if there's a tab that says articles and essays, take a moment to take a look at that section because there's sometimes some really great materials there. So with this particular collection, um, there is several different things that you can find here. So you see there are tabs about, you know, songs of immigration and labor or immigration and migration, uh, work and industry, social change. Um, so let's look, I think it's this one. Um, so this work in industry, and you'll see that again, there's some different examples that they pull out. Um, and then if you scroll on towards the bottom of this, there is also a section where you see there's some different resources and they have a tab called Songs of Unionization, Labor Strikes and Child Labor. Um, and again, what's really cool about this is you'll see that they have picked out some examples. And so you can you know, click on one of these and it will actually take you to where you can find that item at the Library of Congress. Now, something that I will recommend, so if you find, you know, some song sheets that the library has where they're not actual recordings, sometimes if you do a Google search or a YouTube search, you can find where people have recorded these, and so you can actually hear the songs. Um, that's something that um, I, we're doing our newsletter for this next month on music, and that I've been able to successfully find a couple like that. So again, you have the song sheet. Um, but then you can actually find a recording somewhere else on the internet where someone's actually performing that so the students can hear it, uh, which I think is really important. Um, so again, definitely this collection and looking through some of those tabs and articles and essays, um, you can find some really great resources that you can again build some other activities around. Not to mention there's just some great secondary source material here that can help you to again give some larger context for this. Now, um, we have mentioned uh, some different things kind of associated with the American uh, Folk Life Center, um, and this is their website. Um, you can see here that they're under special projects. You have, they have a tab for the Lomax family collections, um, and you can see, uh, again, some of um, that material that's referenced here, um, because again, he uh, was kind of the curator for the archive of American folk songs. Uh, and so again, a lot of material there. Not everything is digitized, um, and so that can be a little frustrating, but there is, again, some good material here, and the library has a couple of different collections. Um, so one, uh, I don't think the bar is going to be in my, yeah, let me switch over here. All right, so the first one, um, so the John and Alan Lomax paper collections, um, that kind of, again, has some great material from the work that they were doing with the library, um, so you can go out and kind of collect um, these uh, songs and materials. The other thing that they have here that can be very helpful is here under um, expert resources. Um, they've linked in several different things here that can be helpful to again, find other materials related to that work. Um, so I would definitely um, take a moment to look at that. And I know someone had asked a question kind of connecting, you know, the connection between kind of uh, Appalachian music. Um, and so there is some recordings from the Southern Mosaic um, that will have, I think some things maybe from that region um, that that might be of interest to you. Uh, and then the last collection that I want to reference real quickly um, that, um, you know, Stacey mentioned, of course, is this Woody Guthrie um, and the Archive of American Folk Song. Uh, it's a correspondence uh, collection. But again, also, you'll note that there is an articles and essay session with the timeline and then kind of a little biography article here that you could use. So again, some other collections that again can be really helpful to find some materials that kind of again dig into this whole idea of kind of music and labor and, and folk music. Um, so 
again, that's just a real quick sampling of some different things that are out there and available. Um, you know, definitely, uh, if you're interested in this topic uh, and, and music more generally, um, we will be doing our newsletter this next month on music and pulling out some other resources, some different lesson ideas. So definitely check that out. And then we'll be doing um, our regular Dean and webinar next month and kind of digging into those topics. Um, so now, uh, before we wrap up, I'll take just a few minutes if we have any questions, if you guys want to drop those into the chat box. Um, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions, uh, feel free to do so. I'm also going to put the form link in just one more time uh, in case you didn't get to that at the beginning. All right, well, while again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop those in, but we'll go ahead and start to kind of uh, move towards wrapping up. And again, we want to thank everyone um, for their time today and for joining us um, for this session. Hopefully we've given you some kind of kernels of an idea of things you maybe can use with students. Um, and kind of engage them in a different way. Um, as uh, Layla mentioned earlier, we will be doing uh, another webinar with the East Tennessee Historical Society um, next month on uh, February the 17th on Francis Perkins and the role of the Secretary of Labor. And so if that's something that you're interested in, let us know and be happy to get you registered for that. Um, again, if you haven't done so, please be sure to complete the contact form um, that we shared earlier. Um, it's really important that we have that information. And again, for those of you attending live, um, you are eligible for a stipend and we uh, wanna make sure that we get that to you. Um, so if you need that link again, let us know, we can drop that back in the chat box. And then lastly, um, if you are interested in receiving uh, PD credit for today's um, workshop or for today's webinar, um, we would like for you to take a moment to complete um, our kind of survey, our post survey. And I'm going to drop that link in here. And for those of you um, that are watching this webinar, we'll put the link in the uh, video description um, on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to find that link there. Um, so again, be sure to fill that out. Uh, we will get those certificates out to you um, here in the next couple of days. And if you're watching the recording, we check those um, and get those out once a week. Um, yeah, and as Layla mentioned, uh, for the contact form, please be sure to include your home address on that form so that um, the East Tennessee Historical Society can send out those stipends. It typically takes about three to four weeks for those to get turned around to you. So again, if you have any questions, please let us know. Otherwise, again, thank you guys so much for your time, and we hope to see you next month.